Hello and welcome to the 12th lecture of the course Basics of Semiconductor Device and Technology. So far we have uh, learnt about uh, or learnt up to um, basics of carrier transport which covered drift and diffusion transport. Um, in the previous considerations, uh, we assumed that the, the carrier is uh, under equilibrium condition or the system is under equilibrium condition, uh, which means there is no change uh, as a function of time. Um, however, the question is what happens if there is an abrupt change or a change as a function of time in the uh, in the uh, the electron or the hole concentration across the system. Now any change uh, as a function of time uh, which is uh, which pushes the system into non-equilibrium conditions is called excess carriers, excess uh, majority carriers or excess minority carriers in the system. Uh, any change which happens as a function of time due to the presence of uh, external stimulants like light, uh, temperature or, or field, uh, which is current or voltage bias, um, can induce excess carriers across the system and therefore can push the system into non-equilibrium conditions. Now the transport under non-equilibrium conditions or the transport of these excess carriers happen in a slightly different fashion compared to what we learned in the previous module. Particularly in this case, these excess carriers, which are majority or the majority excess uh, or minority excess holes or electrons, in most of the cases would be moving together. So in the previous discussion, you know, related to current transport, we did not address the non-equilibrium conditions where we kind of assumed that the equilibrium was not significantly disturbed or not at all disturbed. Um, and as I said that the excess electrons or the excess holes in the conduction band or valence band can exist um, in addition to the thermal equilibrium concentration whenever an external excitation is applied across the semiconductor and that external excitation could be you know uh, temperature could be uh, shining light or could be applying voltage or current. So in this module we are going to talk about the behavior of non-equilibrium electron hole concentration as a function of time and space coordinates. So how basically they evolve as a function of time and evolve as a function of co coordinates means how they move in the xyz direction. We'll also see that these excess carriers diffuse, drift and recombine with the same effective diffusion coefficient, drift mobil mobility, lifetime uh, in, in under non-equilibrium kind of conditions. This phenomena is actually called the ambipolar transport and that's why we will also be discussing what is ambipolar transport. That's particularly relevant to majority of the semiconductor devices. Majority of the semiconductor devices operation would be uh, under uh, the presence of these excess carriers. Uh, in other words, the excess carriers dominate the electrical property of most of the semiconductor devices materials and therefore the behavior of these excess carriers is a fundamental topic which must be learned and understood. Okay. So um, quickly what we what did we learn so far? So we have seen that uh, you know everything was under thermal equilibrium conditions um, or in other words whatever equations we derived for transport earlier assume that the thermal equilibrium condition was not significantly disturbed. Now as I said in uh, my introduction that what are the conditions that can disturb equilibrium that could be you know abrupt change in the field. So let's say you have a certain field applied across the system and suddenly you have a change which is increase or the reduction in the field applied across uh, a given system right which could be because of the change in uh, in the voltage or the change in the current flowing through the system it could also be because of abrupt change across the temperature so let's say you know the system is at t equals to uh, 
t naught and suddenly at a given time t1 this t naught changes to t naught plus delta t or minus delta t so this is that sudden change or abrupt change in the temperature now so the point at which the time instance at which the sudden change is applied the device would get into non equilibrium condition the device will tend to generate these excess carriers and then the process of achieving the equilibrium state uh, is something that we are going to learn in this module uh, on top of that of course ap application of external excitation such as light so let's say if this was not temperature at a certain time you had as a certain instant let's say that the the photon intensity across the device was i and suddenly at at certain time t 1 let's say the i changes to i plus delta i or i minus delta i where delta i is always greater than 0 i could be 0 you know you can have a situation where there was no light falling on the device and suddenly at a time t1 uh, the device experienced uh, photon intensity of delta i right so that will change that will lead to or offer this external excitation that will lead to electron hole pair generation uh, if the uh, light wavelength is sufficient enough to generate those electron hole uh, pairs and the device will get into non equilibrium kind of conditions now the question is okay fine the excess carriers are generated so how does it affect the device behavior so first is any excitation across the device would lead to uh, disturbing the electron and hole concentration we have seen in previous modules that the transport across the device whether it is drift uh, whether it is drift current uh, or whether it is diffusion current they both depend on the electron or the hole concentrations now if the electron concentration let's call this the the equilibrium concentration is n naught if the electron concentration changes from n naught plus delta n then of course the drift and the diffusion transport is are going to be affected now on top of that what we will also experience that if there is an excess carrier excess uh, electron generated corresponding there will be all there also be an excess hole generated and we'll see that these excess electrons and holes they basically uh, move drift uh, diffuse uh, recombine together generate and recombine together and therefore in this particular case when we are dealing with their transport we have to basically consider a collective behavior of these two i'll give you one example where you know these excess carriers could be present for instance let's say you take a pn junction diode right this side is p this side is n now you apply a forward bias right now what will happen the forward bias is going to push the holes which are majority carriers here to this side and push the electrons which are majority carry here to this side so these electrons these electrons will become minority carrier excess minority carrier uh, concentration and these holes will become excess minority carriers at in the n side now the transport of a pn junction diode is heavily dependent on these excess carriers present in the p and the n region so in the p region the excess carriers are uh, minority electrons which basically moved from the n region to the p region and at the n side the uh, the excess carriers are these minority holes which actually move from the p side to the n side so the transport here is heavily dependent on these minority carriers which basically uh, moved from the one side to the other side and therefore you know when we are deriving in the next module that when we derive the equations transport equations for pn junction diode we will be using the kind of equations that we are going to derive in this module defining the collective movement of these excess minority carrier electrons and holes now another thing that will happen you remember that the fermi energy level was a strong function of or was solely a function of the electron concentration or the hole concentration the majority carrier uh, concentration across the system right um, of course the majority carrier concentration also affected the minority carrier concentration so we can say that majority carrier concentration affected the fermi level or in other words fermi level affected the majority carrier concentration now if the the uh, the carrier concentration has changed from n naught 
let's say n naught plus delta n and p naught to let's say p naught plus delta p right so in that case we can call n naught as n and p naught as p so n becomes n naught plus delta n and p which is the total whole concentration becomes p naught plus delta p so early the fermi, fermi energy level was dependent on n naught or p naught now it will depend on n naught plus delta n and p naught plus delta p so earlier when there was only one fermi level which is because of the majority carrier now since the this concentration can be significant there can be two fermi levels and therefore they are called quasi fermi energy levels we will also talk about that since these are excess carriers and they basically generate together they are they are bound to generate together therefore they are also bound, bound to recombine together so we'll also see you know how the recombination generation uh, happens uh, while generation is a process in which the electron and holes are created right and recombination is a process where the electrons and holes are annihilated right so they are gone from the system Okay, so let's uh, understand this further. So we know uh, that in the equilibrium condition, the the electrons and holes, their concentrations are independent of time. Um, now, if there is a thermal excitation, as I said, uh, there will be excitation of electrons to the conduction band which will leave a hole behind and therefore you have electron hole pair generation. Now what will happen is that these electrons will then further randomly move in the conduction band and once in a while they will encounter the hole sites, the sites where they can recombine with a hole or they lose their energy and recombine with uh, the holes. Um, in other words, this is called recombination, you know, as the electron fall from the conduction band into the empty valence band states. Now in the um, if the net carrier concentration is time independent right um, then we can fairly assume that the rate of generation is equals to rate of recombination. Um, additionally if the electrons and holes are generated in pair um, they must be recombining in pair and that's always the case if they are generated in pair if the electrons as the process show here if they are generated in pair so when an electron moves to the conduction band they leave a hole behind and when the electron comes back to the valence band it recombines so an electron hole pair generated in pair it's going to recombine in pair right so therefore one can say that the rate of generation of electron is the rate of generation of uh, recombination of the holes right and therefore let's say if the generation rate um, is G and we can write the generation rate for electrons as G n and we can add 0 for equilibrium condition then this generation rate is the same for holes under equilibrium condition. Similarly, if the recombination rate of electrons under equilibrium has to be same as the recombination rate of holes under equilibrium because they generate together they recombine together and now if the system is in equilibrium then the generation then the net chain electron and hole concentration must remain constant and for that to remain constant the generation rate must be equal to the recombination rate and therefore we can write their generation rates are also equal to the recombination rate and hence while there can be a finite generation recombination present at any given time the net generation and the recombination rates are equal and therefore there is no change in the electron concentration. So in the thermal equilibrium conditions, if you write n equals to n plus del T and p equals to p naught plus del T, as for a large enough time, the n will tend to n naught and p will tend to p naught where this delta uh, sorry this is delta n delta p so this delta n delta p would uh, be negligible and the net change across as a for large amount of time uh, 
would be negligible and therefore one can consider this in the equilibrium condition where the total electron concentration or the total hole concentration doesn't change as a function of time. That's the condition when the generation rates and the recombination rates are equal. Now let's assume that an event An event creates excess electron hole pairs. Now this event could be as I explained in the previous slide, it could be you know high energy photon. So you shine light across the system for a finite amount of time. It could be you know sudden excess change or change in the temperature or it could be a sudden change in the applied uh, voltage or current, right? So now let's say if this event creates excess electron hole pair. Um, now you know that the electron and holes are going to be generated simultaneously. So if they are generated simultaneously, right? Let's say in this case a photon uh, is is bombarded on the semiconductor, right? And therefore you have these excess electrons generated. These elect excess electrons are generated simultaneously means by exciting these electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, leaving the holes behind. Therefore, the number of electrons or the rate of generation of electron and the rate of generation of hole is going to remain the same. And that's why we can write the rate of generation of electron where Gn dash is the rate of generation of electron is same as Gp dash which is the rate of uh, uh, generation of holes. Now let's assume that the delta n or the delta p are the excess carrier concentrations where delta n is the excess electron concentration and delta p is the excess hole concentration, right? Then how can you write the non-equilibrium carrier concentration? You can write it as, as n which is the total concentration equals to n naught which was the thermal equilibrium concentration plus delta n which is the excess electron concentration and p which is the total hole concentration equals to p naught plus delta P where P naught is the thermal equilibrium hole concentration and delta P is the excess hole concentration. Now keep in mind that in this case NP the product of NP is not equals to the product of NP0. The product of N0 P0 was equals to Ni square. Earlier in the previous chapters or previous modules we had written simply this simply as NP equals to Ni square. But we explicitly stated that N and P are electron and hole concentration under equilibrium condition. Now we have redefined the notation. The notation N and P are the total electron and hole concentration, whereas N naught and P naught are the equilibrium electron and hole concentration. So N naught and P naught equals to Ni square, but N and P, N times P is not equals to N naught p naught and therefore n times p is not equals to ni square right n is n plus delta n and p is p plus delta p right um, so this is uh, an important point to keep that keep in mind we will be using these notations very often in this chapter and in the previous in the in the subsequent modules right so now we were talking about the generation rate now the recombination the recombination happens in the same way so these uh, excess electrons are going to travel in the conduction band and somewhere they will basically scatter they will lose their energy with the lattice atoms they will actually come back to a lower energy state which is the valence band and therefore they will recombine with these uh, empty energy states which were holes present in the valence band, which means that an electron which is uh, recombined, the hole is also recombines, right, with the with the electron. So while the electron recombines with the hole, you can see this as an as an hole recombined with an electron, right? So you can say that the recombination rate of the electron is same as the recombination rate of the hole. Uh, let me highlight that unlike the thermal equilibrium condition or the equilibrium condition here the generation rate may not be same as the recombination rate. The generation rate might be different that could be dependent on the external stimulant and the rec recombination rate will be dependent on the internal system.
I must also highlight that all this discussion is true for direct generation and recombination. This is true for systems where you have where or systems or semiconductors which have direct uh, band gap, which is the case when you know you shine light and you have excess carriers or electrons and holes generated in the same quantity with the same rate and they recombine in the same quantity and in the same rate. But if it is an indirect semiconductor, the generation and recombinations are rather complex. Uh, the generation rates and recombination rates are rather complex and we are not going to talk about that in this particular course. So before I proceed, let us see if we can uh, you know, re uh, quickly review some of these notations that we are going to follow uh, in, this, uh, in this particular module. So as I said, N0 and P0 are thermal equilibrium electron and hole concentrations. This is independent of time and also usually independent of position until and unless it is not explicitly specified. Many In many situations, we will basically consider N0 as uh, N0x, uh, which is basically, let us say, something to do with the function of x. But many times, we will consider N0x as N0, which means it is not function of x for simplicity, but you can always change that uh, to do uh, to be a function of x. If it is function of x, that does not mean that it is in non equilibrium condition. It can be a function of x, y, z. Uh, still, it can be in equilibrium condition. But if it is a function of time, then it is in the non equilibrium condition. right? So, whatever we said earlier, whatever we used earlier, we used uh, earlier for these things, we used just n and p. Now, since the definition of n and p is going to be changed, we are changing earlier n and p with n naught and p naught, which is thermal equilibrium electron and hole concentration. So, what n and p becomes? n and p will become the total electron and the total hole concentration. Um, now, this could be a function of time, this could be a function of position, right? So now, if we know n naught p naught, if we know n p, what is the excess carrier concentration? The excess electron concentration is the difference of n and n naught, right? And excess hole concentration is the difference of p and p naught. Now we also define the generation rate and the uh, recombination rate. So a small g n is generation rate for electron, and a small g p is generation rate for holes. Similarly, Rn, capital R, n is recombination rate for electrons and capital Rp is recombination rate for holes. We will also define a term called excess minority carrier lifetime. The minority carrier, so let us say if you take n type semiconductor and in this if you have excess holes, these excess holes are the minority carrier. So let us say if you have n type semiconductor in which you have uh, excess carrier generation, you are going to have both excess electrons plus excess holes. These excess holes are called minority excess carriers or excess minority carriers. So these excess minority carriers will also have a lifetime which means they will stay there, they will exist for a finite time before they basically recombine uh, to um, the excess majority carrier or the majority carriers and therefore this lifetime is also important. This lifetime is defined by tau and if you put n then this becomes lifetime for electrons and if you say tau p this is lifetime for holes. So as I said before that the rate of generation depends on the external stimulant, the intensity or the strength of the stimulant. Uh, whether it is in terms of the photon concentration or photon in intensity or the photon uh, uh, energy or the change in the temperature or the change in the electrical field bias current voltage, uh, the rate of uh, recombination is a strong function of the system and the rate of generation. So let us see if we can uh, find a relation between the generation rate and the recombination rate and we can derive some relation out of, out of these things for rate of recombination. So to begin with, let us assume, you know, uh, I mean, we know that the recombination rate or the rate of recombination is supposed to be proportional to the concentration of electrons as well as hole. If you are, if you have more electrons and more holes in the system, the rate of recombination will be higher. If you have lesser electrons, lesser holes, the rate of recombination is going to be lower, right? So we can fairly say that 
that the rate of recombination is proportional to the concentration of electrons and concentration of holes. Now let's assume that alpha r is a constant for generation. Now this alpha r would depend on the external stimulant. So let's let's uh, assume uh, a parameter alpha r, right? Which in a universal fashion that alpha r would be some way related to the external stimulant and the rate at which the carriers are generated. So uh, if the alpha r is the constant for generation, then the total equilibrium generation rate uh, will be dependent on the background concentration. Therefore, one can say that alpha r times n naught times p naught and n naught p naught can also be written as n i square is the thermal equilibrium generation rate. right? So, if you have uh, the steady state concentration as n naught and p naught and alpha r is the constant of generation, then the equilibrium thermal equilibrium generation rate could be alpha r times n naught times p naught. Now, how do we define or how do we find recombination rate? The rec for recombination rate, we have to find the net change in electron concentration. So, how do we find the net change in electron concentration? So, let us say we can we can do it in this fashion. So, net change in electron concentration, if we are talking about electron, uh, let us say is dn by dt, where nt is the uh, concentration of electron is a function of temperature. And then the net change can be found with the, uh, the, the thermal equilibrium generation rate minus the, the actual generation, which is nt times pt. So, nt is the elect total electron concentration as a function of time and pt is total hole concentration as a function of time. So, you can write this as alpha r um, n naught p naught minus alpha r nt p t. This equation will translate into something like this. So alpha r goes out and not p naught becomes n i square minus n t p t. Right? Now, we know n t is n naught plus delta n. We can also write it as delta n t and p t is p naught plus delta p we also know that these excess electrons and holes are created and recombined in pair which means that these two are supposed to be same. We are talking about just the same system where you have both n naught and p naught present and now correspondingly we also got delta n and delta p present and these delta n and delta p are supposed to be same because they recombine and generate in pairs. right? So therefore, we can fairly write delta n t equals delta p t. Whereas we know that n naught and p naught are independent of time. So if we feed all of this into this equation, what do we get? We get this equation where n i square remains as it is. The delta n t becomes n naught plus uh, n t becomes n naught plus delta n t and p t becomes p naught plus delta p t. If we uh, simplify this, what we get is this, which is alpha r minus alpha r n delta n t n naught plus p naught plus delta n t. Now, for low level injection, we know that delta n t um, is going to be lesser than majority carrier concentration. So, we started with a p type region uh, and for a p type region, uh, the delta n t is going to be less than less than p naught and the p naught is going to be greater than greater than n naught and therefore this entire thing can be simplified to the majority carrier concentration i mean i'm just saying majority carrier concentration because if it was um, if it is uh, elect, uh, n type then you have to write uh, n naught if it is p type you have to write p naught so, since I am assuming majority carrier and the semiconductor is p-type semiconductor, the delta nt is going to be less than less than p naught, and p naught is going to be less than less than n naught, which is which means the whole concentration is going to be uh, sorry, whole concentration is going to be greater than greater than uh, electron concentration, and whole concentration is also going to be significantly greater than the excess uh, minority carrier concentration. Therefore, 
this entire thing can be converted into P0 which is excess majority or which is the majority carrier concentration P0. So the equation translates to this which is minus uh, D delta NT by DT where D by DT is the differential term and delta NT is the change in the electron concentration as a function of time equals to minus alpha r, alpha r is the constant for generation, p naught is the majority whole concentration and delta nt is the minority or excess minority carrier concentration, in this case it is excess electron concentration. Okay, so we bring that equation again here and if we solve this equation, what we get, this differential equation, what we get is we get a solution for delta nt which is equals to delta n naught e to the power minus alpha r p naught t. Now the alpha r p naught is a constant and we can write this as 1 upon tau n. Why tau n? Because we are talking about in this case, it is a p-type semiconductor and p-type semiconductor excess electrons are the minority carriers. So this is the, is the recombination time for the minority carriers which are electrons in this case and that depends on the rate of generation which remains the same for both electrons and holes but the majority carrier concentration. And now this becomes obvious that higher the rate of generation higher the rate of recombination, faster the recombination which means uh, uh, it will decay faster, right. So if the alpha r, r is higher which means generation is higher, the recombination is also going to be higher, it will decay faster. Similarly, if the excess majority or if the majority carry concentrations which are, which is the P naught here, it is going to decay faster, more number of holes present, higher probability of these excess electrons to recombine at these hole sites, right. So we can rewrite this equation as delta NT. equals to delta n at t equals to 0 e minus t by tau n naught where tau n naught is 1 upon alpha r p naught right. So So if dn by dt was the rate of change in the electron concentration as a function of time, the recombination rate is nothing but the rate of or negative of the rate of change of the excess carrier concentration as a function of time, right. So why negative? Because I mean one is this is the rate of change and recombination is going to basically lower the rate of change and that is why uh, the negative term, right. So if we apply the negative term, the rate of change is going to be alpha r and if you feed all of this, it is going to be alpha r p naught delta nt and this can also be written as delta nt divided by tau n. So the recombination rate is a function of the excess minority carrier concentration divide by the recombination or the, the excess carrier lifetime which is a function of alpha r times p naught. Now I said earlier that the for you know band to band generation or band to band system that we are considering the, uh, the recombination rate for the electrons and holes are the same, they generate together, they recombine together. Therefore the, both the electron and hole generation rates if it is a p-type semiconductor can be written as delta nt where delta n is the excess minority carriers in p-type semiconductor divided by lifetime of these minority carriers in p-type semiconductor. 
So what is minority carry in PDF semiconductor? That's N, right? If P is majority, if P is the semiconductor, minority is N. So when you are dealing with P-type semiconductor, your other side is going to be dealing with N type, right? So when you are dealing with the recombination and recombination rates of electron and hole in P-type semiconductor, you are actually writing this in form of the excess minority carriers, which are electrons and the excess minority carrier lifetime, which are electron lifetime in P-type semiconductor, right? And this lifetime was a function of the generation constant for generation and the majority carrier concentration. So this you have to keep in mind. Similarly, if we are dealing with n-type semiconductor, we can rewrite this. This is by the way, delta Pn, Pt. So you can rewrite this as delta p t divided by tau p naught. We are using this p naught or this zero term here because we are assuming that the, the um, lifetime is not changing in the function of time. That is an assumption and we will continue with that assumption. Okay, so, um, so far we have seen uh, the definition of these excess carriers, we talked about generation recombination, we talked about uh, how the generation happens in pair and how the recombination happens in pair and how the recombination is a function of generation or the rate of or the constant for the generation as well as the, the, pres the, the concentration of excess uh, uh, minority carrier or the the majority uh, carrier concentrations right and we also try to understand the time response of uh, recombination how that depends on various system related uh, parameters so if we have understood the recombination generation and these excess carriers well let's see how these excess carriers move uh, in a given system right and that's basically takes us to what is called continuity equation Right. So the continuity equation uh, will basically help us understand how these excess carriers behave with time and in a space in the presence of electric fields or the density gradients, right? which means we are talking about both the drift kind of transport as well as diffusion kind of transport. However, for these excess carriers, right? And these excess carriers, as you know, they are present in pairs, which means we have excess holes and excess electrons present all the time. Um, we will see that these excess holes or electrons don't move independently and uh, they would basically diffuse uh, and drift with the same diffusion constant with the same kind of effective mobility. right? But before that, let's, uh, let's, you know, uh, let's see what this continuity equation is, right? Um, so let's say let's take a box right the box has been drawn here which has uh, the finite dimensions as x is delta x um, y is delta y and z is delta z right so this is these are the finite dimensions of this volume right so the area will be dx dy dz let's assume that the, uh, the the carriers which could be excess electrons excess holes or let's say total electrons or total holes are entering from one side and they exit from the other side right let's say the this is uh, we are talking about uh, holes right so the flux of these holes when they enter is f P because this is whole, X because they are moving in the X direction and plus because we are talking about these uh, excess uh, holes present there, right? Um, and let's say at X plus delta X, the flux present is FP X X plus delta X. So this can be, you know, written in form of the FPX using Taylor expansion uh, while assuming delta x tends to zero, 
So this will be fpx x plus dx equals to fpx at x plus the rate of change of the flux as a function of x times delta x, right? And this simple Taylor series expansion, uh, first order expansion, where you basically take the value at the initial point time plus the slope times this distance will give you the final value, right? So this is the initial value. This is the rate of change times the distance traveled gives you the final value, right? So this tells you, right? So these two will tell you the net increment in the number of holes. What is the net increment? The net increment is nothing but how many entered and how many left. And you have to basically take a difference of these two, right? So if you take this side, the difference of this minus this is the net increment in number of holes per unit time, which is this. So, we can also write this as if we are taking a 1D assumption, we can also write this as dp by dt dx equals to this. If you are taking a 3D assumption, then of course you multiply this by dx times dy times dz and also here you multiply it by the cross section which is dy times dz. If you do that here, so dp by dt times the volume, dp by dt is the, the rate of change times the volume is the net increment in number of holes and the net increment of number of holes is basically the flux which is exiting minus the flux which is entering times the cross section area which is dy times dz. Right? So dp by dt is the net, uh, the rate of change times the volume equals to the difference of what gets in and what get, gets out times the cross section area, right? So you can simplify this by from using this equation. So you have dfpx divided by dx with negative sign times dx dy dz equals to dp by dt dx dy dz. You can simplify this say dp by dt equals to minus dfpx by dx. Right? We rewrite this thing here and so this becomes this as I said and if I can simplify this further dp by dt equals to minus df px divided by dx. Of course, these, uh, this derivative, this derivative, if it is a 3D case, then you have to take the divergence. We will not get into that. We will stick to the 1D analysis. But then this dp by dt is only because of the change or the, the, the entry or the exit of the flux. right? Uh, what if there is a finite generation in the recombination? What if I say that this carrier would increase because of a generation and can also decrease because of generation? The rate of change would also be dependent on finite generation and finite recombination inside that, that differential volume. right? Of course, delta G could be 0, delta, uh, sorry, G could be 0, R could be 0. And in that case, the equation translates to just this much, right? But just let's take this universal scenario where you have generation and recombination present, right? So in that case, what will happen? The total uh, change in the whole concentration, if we have to feed that generation and recombination back in this equation, the total change in the, in the whole concentration will also be in with this we add g times delta volume minus r times delta volume delta volume is dx times dy dx times dy times dz right 
so that brings takes us to this point and if we take out dx dy dz which is the delta volume we are just talking about the um, the rate of change of holes in this case translates at us to this equation where gp is the generation rate of holes and p by tau pt is, a, is the recombination rate in this particular case. Okay, similarly you can write the same thing for electrons dn by dt equals to minus dfn by dx and these signs only depict the direction in which they are moving. If this is electron, if this is plus, it was moving in the plus direction. If it is electron, it is moving in the negative x direction. Okay, now what else we can do? Right? You know that the flux is nothing but the current density divided by charge. So, if it was whole, Fp, which was moving in the pl plus direction, your flux is nothing but the whole current density divided by the whole charge, which is positive E. And if it is flux for electrons moving in the negative direction, this is electron current density divided by minus electron charge. Right? Now, what is this whole current density, electron current density? The electron current density or the whole current density is what we have seen in the previous modules as the total drift and the diffusion component. So, this is for holes and this is for electrons, right? So, where you have the drift component which is uh, total electron concentration times the electron mobility times the charge times the field plus the diffusion component which is the charge times the diffusivity of electron times the gradient of electron. In this case, it is one dimensional analysis, so one dimensional gradient of the electron, right? Now, if we divide this with plus E and divide this by minus E, what we get is flux for holes and flux for electrons and that is what we do here. The flux for holes is Jp divided by plus E, right? So, this becomes mu p p e minus dp dp by dx. So, the electron is gone whereas, the flux for the for the electron flow is Jn, please correct this, divide by minus E. So, in this case the electron is gone with minus and a minus charge comes, this electron is gone and a minus charge comes. Okay. So, if I rewrite this, if you use these two equations, this one and this one and feed it back into the equation that we derived in the previous slide, which was this equation, right? where dp by dt equals to the derivative of the flux plus gp minus p by tau pt. So, we feed that flux equation into this, what do we get? We get minus dp by dt equals to so, this was the generation and the recombination term and this is d by dx of fp, right? And this is d by dx of fn. So, how, what do we get? We get this, this will get differentiated once and this will get differentiated twice, right? So, that is why you get this minus mu p d p dx plus d p del square p by dx. Same for the electron, right? Now, for 1D analysis, this term del p e by dx can be written 
as this where you can assume that both field and the whole concentration are a function of x right and therefore this entire equation will get changed to this we'll see that again we write it fresh so this is for the holes and this is for the electrons now we can further simplify this we know that this p or this n or this p and this n or even in this case this p or this n are nothing but pt equals to p naught plus del p t and this is n t equals to n naught plus del n t. So if you feed this, if you feed this in the first equation and you feed this in the second equation and you know that n naught and p naught are independent of time, your entire equation simplifies to what you see here, right? Now, worth highlighting that for simplicity, I have written this del P or what I had written here as del NT or del PT as del P. In principle, this del NT is actually del NXT and del PT is actually del PXT. But for simplicity, I have just written this as del N or del P. But you know that this del P or this del N are function of X as well as time. Right? Now, we will have special scenarios where, you know, they may not be function of uh, X, they may be constant to X, they may not be function of time, they may be constant with time. But those are special considerations and that we will see how to simplify some of these things uh, in later slides. Okay, so I told you in the beginning that uh, these excess electrons and excess holes, basically they move together. And in the previous slide, I had shown you two equations. One was for the excess electrons and one was for excess holes. The question is how do we, you know, unify all of this? So before we unify, let's see how, what is the reason why they basically move together, right? So assume that a pulse of excess electrons uh, and pulse of excess holes are created uh, at a particular point in the semiconductor uh, having an applied electric field which is outside this this semiconductor right so this is the bias applied outside outside so there is an external or applied electric field right and uh, this is uh, in this particular system you have you know a pulse of excess electrons and a pulse of excess holes. Now what will happen? These electrons and holes will try to drift according to the field, right? Electrons will drift towards in one direction and the holes will drift in the other direction. Now as they drift in the other direction, before they start drifting, why they came? They came because let's say at that particular point, right? We, we talked about at particular point, um, right? We, let's say you have certain uh, uh, generation of these electron hole pairs because of shining light at particular point or whatever, right? So now you have this excess electron um, uh, cloud or pulse generated and excess holes, whole cloud or pulse generated. Now they will try to drift away uh, because of this external applied electric field. Now as they try to drift away, there will be a charge separation and you know that whenever charge separates, an internal field or a field will get developed between the two uh, or the charge clouds of different polarities, right? So now the total electric field becomes the external applied field plus the internal applied field. Um, now what will happen is that, uh, so the external applied field will try to drift them together and the internal applied field will try to hold them together and that's, 
that's basically so if one of them dominate uh, in terms of the charge concentration then the effectively everything will move in uh, 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 in the dominant uh, charge and the dominant field direction where internally they are holded together because of the built in electric field right so um, what is the what is the built in electric field this is the um, the the change in the the electron and the whole concentration times you know you have certain system related or the material related constants now the point is that you need a very small amount of electric field for keeping them holding together now if this if we consider charge neutrality at any point the delta n and delta b must be same at any point in space and time and therefore there must be no built in electric field but the fact remains that in in reality the delta n and delta p are never same when in in practice when the generation happens uh, you will never get the exactly same amount of excess electrons versus same amount of excess holes and that basically helps in keeping that internal or built in field that built in field would be very small very very much pretty much negligible compared to the external field but as far as that built in field is available which could be even because of let's say orders of magnitude a smaller difference between the two it could be just 1% difference between the two that sufficient enough for having this built in field and therefore the particles keep staying together diffusing together and drifting together right and in what direction they will drift they will drift basically uh, according to the field and which particular charge is is dominating right and uh, of course so this is about how they move together and always remember that you know we talked about that they are generating together therefore uh, you can say that for both electrons and holes now we can unify that we can say that both electrons and holes the generation rate is g for both uh, um, uh, electron holes the recombination um, rate is r because they recombine together and uh, for charge neutrality and for fairness of the system we can since they are generating together we can assume that delta n is delta p in reality delta n is close to delta p this helps in getting these things holding together moving together but for mathematical simplicity we assume that delta n equals to delta p so therefore the lifetime here includes the thermal equilibrium lifetime carrier lifetime and the excess carrier lifetimes that we are talking about so if we if we go back to our continuity equation we can rewrite that continuity equation in this particular fashion right where we basically converted delta n and delta p to same term delta n um, we changed uh, gp and gn to g and rn and rp to r okay so we elaborate this with our drift and diffusion equation embedded into the continuity equation and now what we can do we can simplify this further right we all we have to do is we have to find one universal equation which basically defines the transport of these excess uh, majority or minor excess minority carriers uh, and these excess minority carriers are same as excess majority carriers right so we can what we can do we can multiply equation a with p mu p and equation b with n mu n this is basic simplification that you would have these kind of simplifications you would have done in in uh, standard 11th or 12th right so uh, and then you know after multiplying this with uh, uh, with these terms you add these two equations what you get is this right and now you divide this whole equation with this which is n mu n plus p mu p what do you get you get this equation where d dash is a function of mu n n dp mu p p dn right and the mu dot mu dash which is the effective mobility is a function of mu n mu p difference of the electron and hole concentration and again n mu n p mu p right if i simplify this first further we know the einstein relation this is something i taught in previous modules and if i use this einstein relation i can get rid of one of those terms and write d dash in the form of removing mobility in the form of diffusivity d and dp uh, times electron and hole concentration 
and the mobility was already in the form of the electron and hole concentration as well as their mobilities. So now the, uh, the effective diffusivity and the effective mobility is written in the form of the, if the actual electron and hole mobility and the concentrations and actual electron and hole diffusivity and the concentrations. Right. So, this is the simplified unified continuity equation that we are going to follow and this is the equation which is which is for the, the collective movement of these electron hole pairs. Right. Now, we can see some more simplification into this and that is something is going to be surprising to you. For instance, if we rewrite this diffusivity, we had this you know n, we, we had this n plus p. Now, n we know is n plus delta n and p we know is uh, p plus delta p. So, we simplify that right and now if it is p type semiconductor under low level injection what we know is n naught is less than less than p naught and delta n is less than less than p naught. You feed all of this you make simplify this what you find is for p type semiconductor the diffusivity for the mb polar transport is nothing but the minority carrier diffusion constant right. So, for p type semiconductor minority carriers are electrons and this depends on the minority carrier diffusion constant. Similarly, for the p type semiconductor the effective mobility is nothing but the minority carrier mobility. Now, keep in mind that this is positive right because in case of holes p type semiconductor the flux that we defined was positive. It was moving in the the, the holes were moving in the same direction as the forces right. In case of electrons it is negative. So, you simplify this for, for n type semiconductor the diffusivity translates to the minority carrier diffusivity which is the whole diffusivity and the mobility effective mobility translates to the effect the minority carrier mobility which is the whole mobility but with the negative sign which means it is in the opposite direction right. So, that is what I said that if it is p type semiconductor or depending on whether it is p type semiconductor or n type semiconductor the movement is the movement of these excess carriers is going to be defined by the minority carriers um, and that simplification can be used in most of the scenarios in future. So, finally, for low level injection condition the mb polar transport equation would become let us say for, for p type semiconductor it, uh, it becomes a function of the diffusivity or the diffusion constant and the mobility of electrons which are the minority carriers here and for n type semiconductor it becomes the function of diffusivity or the diffusion constant of holes and the mobility of holes which is the minority carrier in this particular case right. Also keep in mind that the generation rate uh, while remains the same the recombination rate is also a function of the minority carriers or excess minority carrier concentration and the minority carrier lifetime and this minority carrier lifetime you remember was a function of the, the generation constant or rate of generation constant times the majority carrier concentration. So, this equation we are going to use in future. However, with some simplifications if needed. For instance, if this is steady state, if it is steady state you can fairly assume that the rate of change of excess carriers with time is 0. This is both for holes and electrons. If you have uniform distribution of excess carriers which happens you know in case of uniform generation rates across the entire let us say you have this is your silicon or this is your semiconductor region across which the generation happens and if the generation is uniform across the entire region then the, uh, the distribution of excess carriers is also going to be uniform across the entire region which means you can neglect these terms which is the double derivative of the, uh, the excess carrier uh, is going to be 0. Now, if there is no field applied anything which is uh, which is a product which is uh, uh, multiplied with field will become 0 
if uh, you don't have excess carrier generation then the generation rate will become zero and if you don't have excess carrier recombination the recombination rate will come zero okay so keeping that in mind let's look into certain problems these problems are subjective problems to give you a uh, better understanding of whatever we discussed so far uh, i'll talk about these three four problems uh, let's say one of the problem is that you determine the time behavior of excess carriers as semiconductor returns to thermal equilibrium what does it mean so let's assume that you have a large you know uh, infinitely large homogeneous n type semiconductor and there is no field applied that right now assume that at time t equals to 0 a uniform concentration of excess carriers exist in the crystal and that's now across the entire thing let's say this is your semiconductor these boundaries are infinite right and across the entire semiconductor at t equals to 0 you had a uh, um, certain generation certain generation or certain excess carriers present somehow certain excess carriers were were inserted it could be a, a you know a light impulse which had fallen or at the device at t equals to 0 but assume that after you know as the time progresses for let's say for t greater than 0 the generation is zero so there is no generation whatever happened happened at t equals to zero right so at t equals to zero let's say you had an impulse light impulse and then nothing nothing was there after that so um, and let's assume that the excess carriers which are generated are much smaller than the thermal equilibrium concentration so background doping concentration is much much smaller uh, much higher compared to what is actually generated here right which means we are talking about the low level injection conditions so what you have to find you have to find the excess carrier concentration as a function of time so you have to find how the excess carriers right if it is n type semiconductor you are talking about delta p and how that delta p changed with time right so we start with the uh, mb polar uh, transport equation right and now so let's see what we can uh, neglect right the, the 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 concentration was uniform across the entire uh, device right so uh, since the generation was uniform at whatever happens happens right so you have uniform concentration of excess carriers so this term becomes zero right now for t equals to zero the um, the generation rate is zero right now there is one more thing the the field across the system is also zero so this also becomes zero so this becomes zero this becomes zero and this becomes zero so what are we left with we are left with this part right so that comes here and this simple first order differential equation if you just solve this what you get is this this is nothing but let's say at t equals to 0 you got these excess carriers and these excess carriers are going to decay as a function of time right and now you know that this delta p is same as delta n so you can also write the same equation for delta n okay let's see the other problem now in this case what we are saying we have added something else right so you have to find again the same time dependence of excess carriers in reaching a steady state condition now why we are talking about steady state condition because in this case same as previous but right zero electric field uh, you have to assume that the device before t equals to zero was in a thermal equilibrium but for t equals to zero and t greater than zero a uniform generation rate exists so the only difference from the previous problem is that earlier we assumed this was zero now we are saying this is finite right so which means that across this semiconductor region you have a constant generation the generation is is always there right starting from t equals to zero till infinity so the question is would this uh, system get excess carriers so many excess carriers that you know it will tend to infinity or what is going to happen it is going to achieve certain steady state number finite number right so let's find that so you again write this equation this was zero right because uniform concentration homogeneous semiconductor this is zero because there is no field this is finite let's say that is g and then you have 
this and remaining. So, this whole equation translates to this. This again the same first order differential equation and this kind of equation will give you this kind of solution. So, where in the previous case it decay right in this case you are actually achieving a steady state situation. Right? So, what does it mean? As as the time progresses, right? So, for t equals to 0, basically this becomes 0. So, the total concentration is 0. And as the time progresses, as it tends to infinity, this component will uh, decay and it will saturate to this. So, this saturated point, this value is g dash tau p 0. So, it, it never exceeds, it does not become infinite. At t equals to infinity, it, it basically stabilizes to a finite value, right? It reaches to g dash tau p naught. Now, keep in mind that this has both generation and the recombination term, right? That is why, so you have basically this balancing action, you have generation, but you also have uh, recombination. And uh, uh, due to this balancing, it does not exceed a certain number, it does not become infinity it stabilizes at a finite value. Okay, now let us look into this problem, right? So, in this case, what we are saying, you have to determine the spatial dependence of excess carrier concentration, right? So, now, the um, you have to consider the same p-type semiconductor. It is homogeneous uniform doping, infinite in extent, zero electric field, right? But for a one dimensional crystal, assume that excess carriers are being generated x equals to 0 only. Means this generation is present all the time, but it is present at x equals to 0. In the previous case, the generation was present everywhere, right? The generation was present everywhere. Now, in this case, we are saying the generation is present only at x equals to 0, right? But it is present all the time, it is present only at x equals to 0. Right, the excess carriers are being generated x equals to 0 and will become diffusing in both x in plus x in minus x direction. And that is obvious. You know that if you have generation at x equals to 0, right. So, let us say at t equals to 0, you have uh, an, an spike in excess carriers, but these excess carriers are going to diffuse because of the uh, density gradient, right. They are going to diffuse out from this region. So, what we have to find? We have to find this evolution. Right? Okay. So, again we start with this equation. We know electric field is 0. So, this term becomes 0. We know for rest of the x, the generation rate is 0. Right? And in a steady state, if you say steady state, uh, then we are talking about this rate of change in the electron concentration, the excess carry concentration becomes 0. Right? So, you are talking about finding the evolution only in the steady state condition, right? So, uh, our equation becomes this. This is a simple second order differential equation which we can solve. We know the solution of uh, this kind of equation is of this form, right? Um, so, as the x tends to infinity or minus infinity, the n should become 0. And so, that is how you can calculate b which you will find as 0. And for x greater than 0, a will be 0 for, um, right? So, b will be 0 for x greater than 0 and a will be 0 for x less than 0. So, this is what we find from these two equations, right? And therefore, this equation will basically eventually reduce to this form, which is nothing but our initial exponentially decaying form, but with different signs for x greater than 0 and x less than 0. So, if we plot this, what we get is this. So, we have this generation present across the system, right? And depending on the generation rate, the, the slope would also vary. Now, let us take this final scenario where the field is also present. 
So you know you have to de de determine both time dependence and the spatial dependence of the excess carry concentration. The same thing assume that uh, that the electron hole pairs are generated instantaneously at t equals to 0 at x equals to 0 but assume that you know generation is 0 for t greater than 0. You have to assume this is an n-type semiconductor and a constant field is applied which is E0 and that is applied in the positive x direction. You have to calculate the excess carrier concentration as a function of x and time. So now our excess carrier concentration here is both function of x and time, right? The field is also present, so this this term cannot be zero. This term cannot be zero. The generation for t greater than zero is zero, so that's gone. The recombination is always there, and this is also changing as a function of time, as well as spatial coordinates, right? So you know that this kind of equation has a special solution, where delta p x t can be written in the form of p x t times e to the power minus t by tau p2, right? So if you feed that back and uh, apply the Laplace transform, what we get is a equation of this form. This is a Gaussian equation, right? Uh, where the p x t um, is a Gaussian equation where the p x t is dependent on the time and the location is also dependent on the time right so this is the amplitude and this is the spatial uh, location where the peak exists and that spatial location is also a function of time so if we just uh, write the delta p x t using this equation what we get is this where this translates the amplitude and this is the location what we can see is as a function of temp time the amplitude is decaying and as a function of time, the location where the peak exists, right, where this becomes 0, the peak will exist at x equals to mu p e naught t. This is a function of time, right. So as we can see, the peak is a function of time and the peak amplitude is also a function of time, it is decaying with time. So it is moving with time, right? And the amplitude is decaying with time. Now what would have happened if the field was 0? We have read it in this. Now the location is also a function of field, right? So where the peak is x equals to mu p e naught t. Now if e naught was 0, then x was always 0, means the peak was always at x equals to 0. So this is another thing that we learn from this particular problem, right? I already told you this. Okay, uh, there are two more small short topics uh, before I can conclude this module. One is the dielectric relax relaxation time constant. So let's assume, suppose you know uh, you have a charge neutrality condition and suddenly it's disturbed because of injection of excess holes and electrons by some mean. You know these excess holes are injected somehow, or let's say generated uh, because of uh, an impulse of photon uh, being shined on the device, right? Now what will happen to the charge neutrality, whether the system will again achieve charge neutrality and if it is going to then how fast, right? That's the question that we must be asking. How do we address it? Let's write these very simple equations. You know the Poisson equation which is uh, uh, del dot E equals to rho by epsilon. You know the Ohm's law which is J equals to sigma E and you also know the continuity equation. We just derived that. Assume, you know, let's neglect the generation and recombination for the time being. Then your continuity equation translates to del dot j equals to minus d rho by dt, right? Where rho is nothing but the net charge density with the initial value of uh, charge, right? Uh, del p. So what do we do? We can write del dot j. We can take j from sigma e. So del dot j becomes sigma 
del dot e and del dot e is rho by epsilon. So this becomes sigma times rho by epsilon. Now del dot j is also minus d rho by dt. So we can write sigma rho by epsilon equals to minus d rho by dt. Right? We can change this equation. It basically becomes this first order differential equation which uh, has a simple exponential solution. So your rho as a function of time is rho at t equals to 0 times e t by tau d where tau d is nothing but the dielectric relaxation time which is epsilon divided by sigma. So higher the epsilon, faster, um, uh, slower the decay and higher, uh, higher the sigma, faster the decay. Right? So these are the two factors, the dielectric constant and the conductivity of the material is going to define how fast the system will achieve charge neutrality kind of a condition. Now before we close, this is the last topic. Um, I told you in the beginning that the Fermi level is also going to be affected because of these excess electrons and excess holes. right? So you know that the Fermi level uh, and the thermal equilibrium electron and hole concentrations are related to each other using this particular equation. So as the Fermi level moves up towards the conduction band, right? if this is EC and if this is EF, this is EFI and this is EV. As this moves up, the electron concentration will go up. Similarly for p-type semiconductor, as this goes down, the hole concentration will go up. Now what will happen to these Fermi energy levels and we basically consider the same Fermi energy level. So this and this were same for a given system. right? Whether you use this equation, we use first equation, you find the Fermi energy level and using this Fermi energy level you can find the hole concentration or using this you can find the hole concentration and you can using this hole concentration you can find the Fermi energy level it will always be the same right but as the system gets into non equilibrium state right by having these excess carriers by having these excess carriers the system is or the Fermi level which is basically defined as an energy level under equilibrium condition is also going to drift away and that will give rise to two different Fermi levels which are called quasi Fermi levels. So there will be one quasi Fermi level for electron and one quasi Fermi level for hole. This is represented by this. So this graph, this chart is a steady state or equilibrium uh, situation where you have a single Fermi energy level and depending on the electron concentration it has a finite gap between the intrinsic Fermi energy level and the Fermi energy level or the Fermi energy level and the electron uh, I mean conduction band. But as the excess carriers are generated you have this, these quasi Fermi energy levels they physically have no meaning but they just have mathematical meaning because when you have these excess carriers to be mathematically correct, you better define the Fermi level as a quasi Fermi level because now the hole and electron concentrations are drifted away from the charge neutrality situation. You remember that you know we always had this charge neutrality and this equation, these equations also must satisfy that N naught times P naught equals to N i square. Since we have drifted away from this scenario, therefore to be mathematically correct, we have to introduce these quasi Fermi energy levels. Uh, which are present or which you can say mathematically present when we have the presence of these excess electrons and excess holes in the system. right? So on this note, uh, let's stop here. Uh, we are done with uh, this particular module. Uh, subsequently, we will start using all the uh, learnings that we have uh, made so far from the uh, quantum transport to the fundamentals of various semiconductor parameters, uh, transport, um, different kind of transport, including the mvpolar transport. Right? We will use all of that and we will try to understand or imply all of that into understanding the device physics and modeling the devices like PN junctions and transistors and so on. Thank you.